Yes. Hey, this is what we're doing. Um, uh, how many of you have met Bernie Daler? Okay. Everybody so, um, sounds like everybody, but one or two. almost except for Emily. So, uh, so what we're going to do uh, today is uh, we are going to uh, ask Bernie as many questions as possible. Uh, the topic is uh, perhaps the comparison and contrast between Bernie's faith system and our faith system. So Bernie is a secular humanist, as you as you know, and. Um, so ask him questions about what he believes and why he believes. Any questions, right? You're willing to take yeah, sure. anything. Yeah. Yeah. And then we'll get the we'll get the dialogue going. Okay. Good. Let's get let's get rolling. Okay. Here's a handout I have for people. I, don't, I probably don't have enough because I ran out of ink this morning. Oh, they can share. Yeah. So take one, and if there's not enough to share. Pastor Nathan said I'm a secular humanist. Uh, it's not a well-known movement, so if you ask a different person what that is, you'll get a different understanding. For me, I promote critical thinking and morality based on um, reason and modern science. Okay, I want to tell you something. I used to be a Christian. I used to be an evangelical Christian. I used to believe exactly what you guys believe. If you believe that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, can you just feel it? I know what you're talking about. I, I also had that. So how could I not? Now I don't believe Jesus exists. I don't believe there is a Jesus in heaven. I don't believe there are gods. I don't believe there's devils. I don't believe there's haunted houses. I don't believe there's any kind of spiritual world at all. Why would I? How could I not believe that when I used to believe, you know, like you guys did? It's because of what I've learned. And... One thing I didn't learn until even after college, I didn't even learn this in college. Um, in fact, I really didn't even learn this until after I left the faith. There's a bunch of things, uh, there's a thing called critical thinking, which is a process on how to think logically. And part of that usually is identifying logical errors or logical fallacies, which shows how you can come to a bad conclusion. And like here, for example, here's a, a printout you can get on the internet. Uh, these are some of the common fallacies that will give you bad conclusions. and there's actually hundreds of them. These are things that people came up with. Just uh, They're just common traps that people go into bad thinking. Like, for example, um, the bandwagon thing. Why do you believe this? Well, because everybody else believes it. Bad logic. That's, that's not logical. You know, everybody could be wrong, for example. A straw man argument. You know, I could say, ah, oh, Pastor Nathan believes in a guy in the sky with a beard, and he's up there just ready to grant her every wish. See how ridiculous this is? See, that's a straw man argument. That's a trick to misrepresent your opponent's side. Um, so anyway, there's, there's a whole bunch of things like that. And, and this is something that's really important to learn, so I have a printout here for you. And like I said, there's, there's actually hundreds of these. So I, I want to tell you that uh, one thing I think is really important is to learn about critical thinking, which entails all these logical fallacies. And the other thing is the importance of evolution. In the year 2000, for the first time, they mapped the human genome. That's all the human DNA. For the first time ever in all of history. And since then, they've also mapped other DNA, uh, like uh, dogs, cats, fish, and everything. And now what they do is they look and compare this DNA across all the different species. This is called genomics. And when you do this, you can see evidence of descent. So this is why uh, people say evolution is a fact. It's not debatable whether humans descended from other animals or not. It's a fact. It's a scientific fact. And you probably heard about this upcoming debate with Bill Nye and uh, Ken Ham. Have you guys heard about this? Ken Ham has a creation museum in Kentucky, and he's a young earth creationist. He doesn't believe in evolution. He thinks the, the universe and the earth is only about 6,000 years old or 10,000 years old. And so Bill Nye is going to say, look, you know, evolution is a fact, and the, and the earth is billions of years old, you know, so it's just, it's just that's going to be kind of an interesting thing. Uh, interesting moment in history. You guys are going to be able to remember this because it will probably be famous and a lot of clips on the YouTube about this for years to come. So uh, anyway, I, I, that's one thing I want to stress on to uh, stress that point is that evolution is a fact. And that will affect your theology because usually when you preach the gospel, what do you start with? Man is a sinner. How did he, how, how did he become a sinner? Well, God made humans perfect, and then they disobeyed God, right? Well, with evolution, we know there was no first man. There's no such thing as a first man, because humans de descended over time in, in a population. So, um, 
it, it, it's not the case that the first human popped out of a non-human. That's not the point. That's not how evolution works. It happens so gradually that you can't really even tell um, the differences. It's only when you look over long, take snapshots over a long time, you see big differences like humans and chimps and other animals. You, you see these uh, uh, big differences. Okay, and I'm not saying we, we evolved from chimps. I'm saying our cousins. I mean, we, we are actually cousins with the fish. You know, if you go back 198 million years or so, I think it is. Or was it generations? I can't remember. So anyway, I'll leave it right there and um, invite you guys to some questions. Ask me your hardest questions. Um, you know, what do you learn in apologetics? What would you say to an atheist? I'm an atheist, basically. I don't believe there's any gods. And I think all the arguments for Christianity are based on logical fallacies. So like when you say, oh, here's uh, some evidence for God, I'd probably say it's some kind of logical fallacy of some sort. So the third, this is, you know, this could be fun, right? It doesn't have to be threatening, so, you know. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, I was wondering, um, in your view, how, what do you do with, um, like, consciousness and the self-awareness that seems pretty unique to humans, especially, like, with their very complicated, mm -hmm. you know, culture and arts and language and all that stuff. And, um, cause there are like three common standpoints for consciousness, which is materialism, dualism, and mysterianism. And I was kind of wondering where mm -hmm. you stand on that. Yeah, so you know, this, this is actually a fascinating question in science and philosophy. And what happens is there's a lot of unknowns here. I mean, you can imagine if you, you know, like I said, before the year 2000, they just started mapping DNA. So at the, before the year 2000, we didn't even know what the human genome was, what the human DNA code is. And even now we have genes and we're not even sure how they, how they operate. Um, so right now there's a lot of gaps in understanding there. Okay, so one thing you said is we seem so different. Yes, we do seem different. Um, but a lot of the things that we show, there are similarities in the animal kingdom. For example, we make tools, and you think, okay, that, they used to think that's a human thing, but then they found out all these animals that make tools. Okay, so then they, they, some people thought, well, you know, we have a sense of humor. That's kind of something different we have that other animals don't have. Well, you can see other animals playing around. You know, it's like, okay, well, we love, that's special. And it's like, well, you can see other animals, they seem to show love. But do you think um, that other animals have like a self-awareness and have philosophy and culture and arts and stuff like right. that? Right. So, like, so self-awareness. Yes. There's actually a self, uh, what they call a mirror test, where they put a, a mark on the, the animal without it knowing it, and they put it into a mirror, and you know, the, they see if the animal wants to, it, it notices it and tries to mark it, up, take it off or whatever. And there are certain animals that have passed this test, like uh, dolphins and elephants and different things. They they started. So all these animal. Um, studies in, in consciousness are kind of actually new. So, so yeah, so self-awareness is something we've seen in animals too. But of course, we cannot compare, I mean, we are beyond the animals because our brain is more complex the way it evolved. See, we don't beat the animals in everything though. We beat them in brain power, but we don't beat them in claws. We don't beat them in teeth. We don't beat them in hide, you know? So like if we're up against a lion, a rhino is going to be better off than us probably because they have thicker hide. But, you know, we don't need it because we have this. So, the other thing I want to, I want to tell you too is consciousness, some, since it's a big unknown, sometimes the Christian apologetics gravitates to all these unknowns and they try to say this is evidence for God. And that's a logical fallacy called appeal to ignorance. It's like nobody knows, therefore it's evidence for God. So I, w I usually say to the apologetics, you know what, really, if you have evidence for your faith, why don't you point to stuff we actually know? Why do you go into these unknowns area? You know, like, nobody knows where the Big Bang came from, therefore it's evidence for God. It's like, wait a minute, why don't you talk about something we do know, like the galaxies are spreading apart so fast or something. How does that, you know, relate to your faith? Instead of looking at, but they don't look at these facts, they usually go to the unknowns. Because there are no facts to support it, I would say. Um, my question about evolution. Um, how or why is it that if um, humans came from the monkeys, there aren't like sort of half human and half monkey things right now? Like, so it would be like a more constant stream if we're just like over the years mm -hmm. slowly evolving. Why is it that there aren't sort of half and half things right now? 
Well, the way evolution works is animals evolve to a certain niche, and then sometimes they have like a, that's why there's invasive species sometimes. Like if you introduce a new kind of rat or snake into Hawaii, you can take over and destroy the natural habitat and stuff. So there's an ecological niche that it can only support so much, and then the other animals usually wipe them out. But you know, kind of a funny monster creature that has a lot of different parts is uh, like the platypus. Have you ever heard about that? You know, he's got the, the it's like a, a mammal that lays eggs, I believe, and he's got the bill of a duck and uh, flippers and all that stuff. So it's kind of a weird, funky animal. So you kind of think that, you know, if God's designing, you know, you think about it, if God designed all these creatures, what is he, what is he thinking? You know, like the, the platypus and all these funny different animals. I mean, you know. But, you know, with evolution, it, it kind of makes sense how all these funny creatures are found. Like, well, they always think of these funny dinosaurs. Oh, he had a vacuum kind of mouth or something. And it's like, why would God make all these variety of dinosaurs and they're all gone? I mean, what's the point of that? But with evolution, see, they say actually that 99.9% of all, 99 .9 or something of all species that ever lived are now extinct. So... You know, like the young earth creationist, he thinks, oh, well, what we see here is kind of like what God made. But it's like, actually, this is like the very tip of the tip of the iceberg as far as species, what you see around here. So, yeah. Um, so you said you believe that, like, everything that we see is just basically everything that exists and that there is basically no spiritual realm. Right. And that we, when we die, we just turn to dust. Do you believe that? Mm -hmm. So... What is the point of trying to figure out everything, you know, trying to figure out how the universe works and why do we do all this stuff, you know, engineering, stuff like that? Why do we look at certain elements and say, oh, this has this characteristic and that one has a different characteristic? What's the point of doing all of that if this is all we have? Well, on one hand, you know, in America, we feel so safe, so we don't even think about this, but, you know, the fight for survival is actually a very important thing. And, I mean, like most of us, we don't even know about what the military does. The military has trained killers. The world is a really rough place out there. And in order to stay on top and even survive, you, you have to be prepared to defend yourself, right? And so one thing we do with technology is we, as soon as they usually invent some kind of new technology, like nu nuclear physics or something, they usually weaponize it right off the bat, the first thing. Because if your enemy gets this, they're going to kill you. So this is why we race to space for space programs. They, they call Star Wars for satellite, you know, the satellite missile defense and attack and all that stuff. So we need to go into science in order just to be a live in this arms race. This arms race is throughout all of nature. All the animals have an arms race, you know, like the antelope and the um, cheetah, for example. You know, the, the antelope, the cheetah chases the antelope, makes it faster, and that's what makes the antelope fast, and that's what gives the, the, the cheetah quicker speed and bigger teeth and claws, and it's just an arms race between the two. If that's the case, Bernie, um, why in our last Beaverton Religion Forum and why largely do secular humanists attack Christianity, blaming Christianity for wars in this world? If what you said is true, and I agree with you, why isolate one group of humanity and say, look what you've done, you've, you've caused all these wars? Well, usually what secular humanists do, they, there's actually this word called uh, planetary. There's a, a kind of a planetary view that we should take of all humanity. We, we are all humans. And it's a fight against what they call tribalism. And usually tribalism is like, my country is the greatest. And sometimes it's like, my God. Like, our, you know, we're, we're going to war in a banner with our God. And our God will prevail. You know, like somebody might say, let's go fight Iraq for America and for God, you know. And even think about, hey, you know, we're Christians, and we're going over there and fight those Muslims. I mean, they might even think on those lines. lines. But right, right. But here's the, here's the thing. When the secular humanist attacks one of these other tribes, I, I mean, you're breaking all of more than one rule of, of logic on your paper by doing that. You're breaking several of those rules when, when you do that. Well, usually, but actually what you're doing is you're taking the tribal warfare into the discussion, into the forum. 
Well, a lot of secular humanists, what they say is that democracy is a superior, I mean, some of them get really specific, and they'll even say democracy is a superior uh, political system, and they'll argue that democracies are not known for rushing off to war, and one of the reasons why they go to war probably is because there's an existential threat against them. I mean, we got to go to war because they're going to come after our country and try to destroy us, so self-defense, we need to go to war, basically. But if every, so. if every human group is prone to this, I mean, you just gave the classic atheist, secular humanist uh, view of humanity in the world, which is very dark. It's very much founded on survival of the fittest. It's very dark, as you painted it. If that is the secular humanist worldview, why on earth would you turn on one tribe and say, shame on you for starting these wars? I don't understand. Um, I mean, who's turning on a tribe? I don't understand that. Well, in, uh, well, for example, in this last Beaverton Religion Forum, you from the stage and then someone from your group, a woman in the, in the audience, made the argument um, basically saying the Christian system is bankrupt because uh, and, and she even listed the Iraq war as if it was a Christian war, if, as if it was a Christian Muslim war. And, and you agreed with her. You, you laid blame on the Christian community for starting wars. And it just doesn't mm, seem... It, okay. it, I, basically, I, if Christians start wars, and they have, it proves the secular humanist point that the whole system is corrupt and doomed to failure, and of course we're going to have tribalism because it's survival of the fittest. We wouldn't expect a world peace. We would expect uh, one tribe to dominate over the other. We would expect some human tribal species to fall by the wayside and disappear. But the thing is, no, see, it, that's your interpretation about I, I said the Iraqi war was a Christian war. I never said that or meant that or thought that. And um, I was just saying if we go to war for oil, it's a bad idea. I know it's a debatable topic. I'm not saying we did go to war for oil. I'm saying if we did, mm -hmm. that's something that a secular humanist would not you know, appreciate or say is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people do go to war for oil, but of course they're gonna phrase it in a different aspect. So I mean, I, I personally don't have a take on it. It's not a big... Well, yes, a, you, you do have a take on it because in your worldview, that makes perfect sense that people are going to go to war for oil because if they get the oil, they're going to survive. No, but, but you, the thing you're missing, though, is that I see all of humanity as one family, as one tribe. It's not, it's not us against them. We are, we are all humans. We are all Africans, as a saying. We are all brothers and sisters. We're all related. We're all cousins. It's ridiculous to say, let's go after the other tribe. <laughs> well, we can go on, but so, I think you're making my point. But I mean, the if, other day, if, the you other have, day, if you have the evolutionist worldview, then then there's just little space for there's little space for anyone working together, let alone working in uh, a, with more than one species even toward peace. Echo balance is is out. Then uh, world peace is out. Frankly, it, it's out because. What's going to happen is everything's going to be dynamic and changing, um, and it's it's destined to happen. Well, you're you sound like you're saying I believe there should be warfare between the races because of evolution. I think your worldview is so dark, without any hope, as you have painted it, that the, I mean the only hope comes from uh, not only disequilibrium, but quite a bit of cataclysm where there are clear losers and clear winners. Why do you say that? Survival of the fittest, just as you said. Uh, entropy, just as you've said. Uh, evolution being a fact, just as you've said. Okay, well maybe... That species die and other ones rise. Maybe the confusion is, um, one thing I believe is that evolution brought us to where we are. It explains how creatures developed. It doesn't mean that evolution should be a social structure. Some people refer to this as Darwinism. There's some jokes about this. But just because I believe that evolution is the method for how humans came to be doesn't mean that I believe evolution is a way we should have a social structure. 
I, it doesn't mean I have to advocate that we should go out and kill all the weak people so the strongest can survive. The, you're, you're, so you're mixing a social thing with a scientific thing. Well, I think those two go hand in glove. I don't see how you can separate them. Why? But maybe you should yeah. take some questions from okay. students. Okay. Well, if what you just said is true, then why do you advocate for it so adamantly? Like you, I mean, at the last religion forum, you asked teenagers in general, do we feel like we're wasting our lives for living for our faith? Do we feel like, you know, why, why live for God now when you can spend eternity with him after you die? Well, in my, what I believe is that if I don't live for God now, I'm not going to have eternity with him. And, you know, you live for him now so that you can spend all of eternity with God and worshiping him. And, like, I have everything to lose by not believing what I do. But by believing, I mean, if I don't, if I don't believe in what you believe and I die and what you say is true, then sure, I'm going to turn to dust and I'm going to have nothing to lose ultimately. Mm -hmm. But I advocate for my faith because I believe that if somebody dies and doesn't believe what I do, mm -hmm. then they're not going to end up where I will. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, what, what do I have to lose by not believing what you do? Like, why are you so adamant about Christians are stupid, Christians are wasting their lives? Like, even if that's true, who ultimately cares? Because we're all going to turn to dust, right? Well, the reason why I care for you guys is because I wish somebody was there to, to help me. It's a matter of education. Imagine there is no God. Okay, for a minute. Imagine there is no supernatural world, and a person grows up believing there is. Okay, now so this is a person who is praying for good weather, and there is no good, there is nobody listening. This is a person who hears that there's a war or there's kids dying over there, and this person says, "Okay, I'll pray," and they really think they're doing something, and they're doing nothing. So you you can see that if what I'm saying is true, if there is no existence of God that everything you're doing from a spiritual aspect is a waste of time and not accomplishing anything. And in fact, it's stopping you from doing something you could be doing. But my, my point is that, you know, is that, I mean, like, is that a reflection of what you did? Like, were you praying for people and not having your prayers answered? Because that's not a reflection of whether or not God's listening to you. That's a reflection of his plan for your life and for the world. Yeah, but I said, you're, you're assuming God exists. I mean, imagine right. God does not exist. See, it's a matter of truth. Either God exists or he doesn't. If he exists, everything I'm saying is totally wrong. But if he doesn't exist, everything you're doing is totally wrong. So it really all comes back to truth, not what makes you feel good, not what makes, you know, you think is better for society or whatever it comes down to the truth. And then you got to deal with the truth. So, okay, I got two questions. Well, did I answer your question? Well, the other thing I want to say about what I said the other night was, what I was trying to say, too, was, even in the Bible, Jesus said that this life is a vapor, right? We're a piece of grass, like a piece of grass. You're One moment you're alive and healthy, and the next moment you're gone and thrown in the fire or, or whatever. So what I'm trying to say is, as a Christian, you see this life as a very temporary thing, and it's nothing compared to eternity, because eternity goes on forever, right? So this is a, that makes it easy for a Christian to say, like, okay, well, I'm just going to, uh, I could throw away my life for God because this life doesn't mean anything anyway. I could go to war for America and God, or I could even go to Haiti and be a missionary and suffer for everything because, you know, it's just 30 years or whatever, and, you know, everything is, doesn't really matter in this life because it's so temporary. What do you mean by throw away your life for God? Do you mean, like, throw away your definition, like serve him, or me, like, waste my life by not living for him? By throw away, I, I'm just saying that it's... In the big picture, it's not, this life isn't worth anything. Um, but, but, you know, it could be, I mean, I could throw my life away for atheists. I'm not saying throw away is a bad word. I'm just saying that is. You're saying just living I'm for saying, humanity? I'm saying in perspective of the eternity, it's nothing. This life is nothing. But it is because what I'm saying is that this is, this is your time to believe in God. Mm -hmm. And this is your, this is when you have to come to faith. Because if you don't, then you're going to hell. Like, that, that's. Um, that's really blunt. I'm sorry, but it's true. I mean, you're. It's like you either believe in him or you don't. There's no really. There's no medium ground because even Jesus said, "Do not be lukewarm." You here's should the, not here's be the point I was trying to make though. Like, like if this is the span of your your earthly life, then eternity is like way, way, way out there, right? Right. But from my worldview, 
There is no way, way, way out there. There is no existence. It's this little time here, that's it. But that's my point. Is and that's, and that's what I'm just saying when you have these different ideas is you're going to live your life radically different. Right. But e my except, point except the Christian believes that this little point is part of a, a continuum. You're, you're making this very sharp distinction between all of eternity and now. But my 30 years now is part of all of this time. What about your one you see, day? So that, what, it, that, what that does, if you see it mm -hmm. on a continuum, Bernie, yeah. it makes, once again, your view to be dark, hopeless, and really inconsequential. It's, it's, your view makes life inconsequential now okay. because it's only this little bit. But the Christian believes that this little bit is connected to eternity. Right, right. We, so we both your, understand it's that. Your, it's your view. No, it's your view that is inconsequential, insubstantial, unhopeful, uh, unusable. Well, that's a, that's a longer discussion about whether it's useful and all that. But my whole point was just that when you're a Christian, you see a lot more beyond this life. And, the, and all that stuff beyond this life makes this life pale in comparison because of the time frame is so short and insignificant. Whereas in my, I'm just trying to show that the difference in contrast in worldviews. Well, let, let, let me put it into another. Wait, I can see why that point. would be like, that wouldn't make sense to a lot of people because it seems like a big waste of time to dedicate your life to serving God and to all these things. But it's hard to deny that it's a waste of life because like Western civilization is founded a lot on, I mean like, on Christianity. Like, people became li uh, literate because the Bible was distributed. And like Christians who, I guess, I guess uh, in an atheistic, hedonistic point of view where this is your only life and live, you know, however you want, like that's great. And I do understand the, you know, how liberating and freeing that would be. And, you know, it, feel, it feels really, really good. But at the same time, it's really hard to deny how that Christianity hasn't been, that like this idea of not living for yourself and living for a higher purpose has not been good for society, even if it's not true. Like the functionality of religion, I think, has like contributed a lot to society, like, you mm -hmm. know, hospitals and schools right, and all right, of those right. things. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's not a bad thing to encourage people not to live, you know, selfishly and just for your own individual pleasures and desires. and. Like that kind of self sacrifice is really unique to religion, and like that kind of community centeredness is really, really unique, especially to Christianity. I've kind of noticed, I, like it, there is that in other religions, but I don't know it. Well, suppose, suppose for example, let me give you an example. Um, do you think you should talk a Mormon out of their faith, even though they're doing good works and everything, and they're doing incredible good works also? Mm, I think you can have a discussion about it with them. But should, you I try to de should you try to deconvert them from their faith? I don't know about adamantly trying to deconvert people unless they actually want to talk about it. But I don't think. Well, it's don't you believe right that? To... Don't you believe that you have the true gospel and their gospel is false? Me myself? Yeah. Mm. There's going to be a, there's going to be a range a wide range in this class on that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of Christians would feel that way. <clears throat> How many people in here, that's like a show of hands, think you should not try to change the faith of a Mormon? I think it's circumstantial, though. No. I'm sorry, so, I mean, how many people are not going to raise their hand well, no matter what? It's one of those things. <laughs> but, um, I don't think that it would matter that much from a non-Christian point of view, because either way, if they're Christian or Mormon, they'll still be doing good works. So I'm trying to ask you from your point of view, though. From your point of view, as a strong, as an evangelical Christian, if that's what you are, I mean, you could be any kind of faith in here. You'd probably be an atheist. You're just going to a Christian school, right? Um, so I'm just saying, even an evangelical Christian, I think, should say we should try to convert a Mormon because a Mormon has a false gospel, and they're probably not even saved. I mean, they're just following some other corruption of the gospel. So we should try to save them with the truth. And if the Mormon says, oh, but we do such good works. Look at all the good works we're doing. How can you say this is bad? Well, good works and truth are two different topics. That's our perspective, though. But you're an atheist, and you don't mm -hmm. have any sort of divine truth that you're mandated to go and tell other people. So why do you, like, why do you feel this need to tear down these 
you know, these tenets and everything that have done a lot of good for society. Right. So you said I don't have any divine truth. The thing is, there's only one truth. Things are real or they're not. There is no such thing as divine truth and scientific truth. There is, there's only one truth. That's it. That's right. Well, that's not answering my question. Well, you said I don't, you said why should I care because I don't have any divine truth. It's not I about mean, like, I mean, like, you don't have some mandate that says go tell all the world that you know, no religion is real and right, revolution right. is the truth. It's my, like, it's my personal interest, that's all. Okay. Okay. I mean, I, the reason why, when I first became an atheist, it was very tempting just to say, okay, I'm just going to live my own life now, I'll leave all this alone. And I thought, okay, well, maybe I should teach my kids what I learned so they don't have to go through the same things I did. And I thought, well, maybe I should teach other people too. And so that's why I do it. But do you deny that there's some value to the functionality of religion within a culture, even if it's not true? Or do you think that true yeah, yeah, that way Yeah, definitely there's some value. There's definitely some value to it. And, and it could be Mormon, Hindu, or whatever. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. some value to it. But is it true? It's no, it's not. And, and if, if people say, well, I know God. Basically, you know, when you get to a lot of the evidences, there's actually apologists. I don't know if you know Stephen, Stephen Gregg, but he's mm -hmm. actually said this. He's a radio apologist. You know Stephen Gregg? No. Uh, I'm so bad on names, Bernie. I'm sorry. He wrote a book, uh, Four Views on Revelation. Uh, but anyway, he says, uh, he even said in the debate one time, like, you know, there's all these arguments for or against God. You know, the bottom line, I just know God is real because I feel him in my heart. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's uh, a fallacy, I believe, that you cannot discern truth by your feelings. I mean, I, I, I even met with some Mormons, and they said, pray about the Book of Mormon. I did. I prayed about it, and I got a feeling. And my brain goes, what are you doing? You can't believe this. You already know too much. So I was a Mormon for like three seconds until my brain said, what, what? It doesn't make sense. Well, on that line of reasoning, wouldn't you not be able to discern truth by sense then? Why? Well, because since sense, your senses are personally yours, mm -hmm. you have no way of, if you can't discern truth from feeling, then, which is also something that's personally yours, then you shouldn't be able to discern truth by sense because you can't get other people to agree with it. Empirically. That, that's a pretty good question. I think that's um, that's that's a good that's a good question that you're you're thinking about. That I'm glad you raised that up. This is one of the powerful things about the scientific method is it removes subjectivity from the whole endeavor as much as possible. So, for example, um, and also uh, the scientific method involves uh, reproducing tests and independently verification. So, you know, if you're deluded and you see something. If somebody else doesn't also see it, then it's, it's not real. Um, so one of the ways, like for example, science removes subjectivity, and this has actually been learned by science because science have screwed this up and they had to catch each other and correct each other. But for example, if you say like, oh, let's do a test on colors. Um, what color is this? And you say red, and somebody says dark red, somebody else says light red. This is not science, this is very subjective. So what they do instead is they try to get a machine and measure wavelengths or something. They'll say it's 850, you know, whatever megahertz or whatever the frequency is. So you, you learn how to do things scientifically and not subjectively. Because what you see is red or blue, you might change your mind and say it's reddish green or whatever, you know, blue green or something. So that's what science does is it removes the subjectivity. That's, that's, that's one of the major objectives of the scientific method. And that's why it's so powerful because it removes delusions from things. You know, you can see a mirage, everybody can see a mirage and say, I swear I see a mirage there, but that's just part of our knowledge base. We learn that what you see is not always right. Even though it can't be scientifically proven, do you think that it may be possible that the spiritual and the physical can dwell on different realms of reality? Um, they don't always sure. interact with each other? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question because sometimes people say like, oh, I just don't believe anything supernatural, therefore there's nothing supernatural. I'd say, no, I'm open to evidence. If there's any evidence, let's look at it. But there's a very popular saying that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. You know, if I said, hey, I drove here in a pickup truck, you could say, sure, I'll believe that, not much skin off my back. But if I said, hey, I came from another planet and I'm leaving tomorrow, do you want to come with me because the whole world's going to get destroyed by a comet? You better say, wait a minute, give me some evidence here, right? Before I put my life in your hands. So, you know, if you're gonna make strong claims, you better have some evidence for That's it. That's a good one, Bernie. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> um, so, would you say that anything subjective isn't like the truth? Because 
because you're saying that like all scientific fact, it has to be like objective and it has to be like true every single time. Well, a science does not use, uh, as far as my understanding, does not use anything subjective. Yeah, so what would you say about love then? Mm -hmm. Because love is very subjective, I would say. So is that right. not true? Okay, so I guess in there, that's, that's sometimes what they go into the soft science, as they call it, like um, uh, psychology and things like that. You know, they, st they, they study things like love. Um, so part of the problem is just because there's so many unknowns and variables. Usually what science, when science studies something with a whole lot of variables, they try to, try to get, um, like you have one case and you have a, um, uh, what do you call the other one, a control. And the control, they usually try to just change one variable at a time. You know, so in other words, if I figure out which apple's best, I don't give you three kinds of apples and give this other kind of person three different apples. I, I try to give you maybe three apples and then maybe one different or something. I don't know, if you want to see a little difference, you try to just control the variables. So, so love is a complicated thing because there's, there's so many things going on and it's dealing with mysterious things like how the brain works, which scientists are still trying to figure out. So. Okay, well, I don't want to get too personal or anything, but um, like, would you say that it's a fact that you love your family or sure. like you love your son? Yeah. But that by what you just said, there's too many variables to actually prove that. And so I'm just asking why would you think that it's a fact that you love your son even though science doesn't really prove it? Well, see, the thing with love is you can't really prove it on somebody else. Like, I can't really prove if Nathan loves anybody because he could be faking it too, right? Oh, they know that I don't love them. Yeah. <laughs> they know that. <laughs> so, so you can't really judge somebody else on that because they could be a good faker. So, oh, yeah. I'm not judging. Right. I was just asking like what you would believe mm -hmm. that to be. So, so, yeah, you know, the thing, the two things about love is there's love as a commitment and there's love as a feeling. You know, one is I, I love this person because I have a strong feeling for them. The other one is love because I have a commitment for them. So love is a complicated thing anyway, too. You probably heard in Greek they have like five different words for love, right? Oh, yeah. So, but in, English, there's, meaning. Yeah. but in English, there's only one word. So, you know, there's like erotic love, a family love, a friend love, and, you know, there's all kinds of different loves. And so it's, it could be a complicated thing. But even the measurement of commitment, that's complicated, wouldn't you say? Could be. I haven't really thought about commitment that much, but... Yeah, I, I told before in a discussion with Nathan, there's a Christian who wrote a book called The Five Love Languages, and it's an awesome book. And, um, you know, and it's funny, he's a Christian, but he never mentions the Bible or God anywhere through the whole thing. But he, it's all from, really, I think, observation about different ways to show love. There's like five major different ways, and, and I thought it was a pretty brilliant book, actually. So, Good questions. What do you got, Isaiah? Um, so, let's see if I can get this. Right. So, would you say that, like, scientific truth cannot interpret other kinds of truth? Like, um, I know some of us probably believe that we interpret biblical truth with other biblical truth. And so, would you say that you kind of interpret scientific truth with other scientific truth? And that the reason that scientific truth and biblical truth don't seem to go hand in hand is because they're not in the same interpretation class, I guess you could say? Well, I would say there's no such thing as, like, again, there's only one kind of truth. There's not different kinds of truth. And what, what's an example of biblical truth? I don't even know what that is. What, what would be an example of biblical truth, you think? Uh, like, just something that's, that the Bible says? <laughs> like, like what, for example? Can you come up with something? Well, uh, that Jesus died on the cross. I mean, that's the obvious one. Okay, that's a that's a um, claim. That's not a okay. That's I mean okay. that's something you can take as a fact if you want to, but um, that's a historical claim. Just like other claims, like you know who is the emperor of Rome or something, and and so you need to look at it to see if it if you think it's true. So the existence of George Washington, president of the United States, is that a historic claim? Mm -hmm. Right, because uh, you can't scientifically prove, and we don't have any eyewitnesses left, right? Well, there's some um, <clears throat> scientific inquiry can go into it. For example, somebody might say, like, here's a piece of evidence. It's a, something written by his own hand. So you can use some science and say, okay, let's look at, let's date this 
paper to see if it's real or just fabricated, you know, and, and, and you use logic and reason to see if things add up together. But, you but know, you're, not, you're not going to be able to, by taking a paper sample, you're, you're not going to be able to prove that George Washington existed. Right, right. So it's all a matter of deduction, looking at the evidences and making a deduction. So, so, that's, that's so the existence of George Washington is a historical claim, period. It is, but I would say it takes scientific thinking. But to, that's going to fall short. No, right? I mean, no. So how is scientific evidence going to prove, how is scientific evidence going to move George Washington's existence from historical claim to fact? Okay, so I just said scientific thinking, not evidence, thinking. Thinking like a scientist. But we're, we're, we're wanting to, we want to scientifically prove. There's, mm -hmm. there's only one truth. I think right. we all agree on that. Move George Washington from historical claim to fact. Right. So, so then you say, let's look at the evidence. What evidence do you have? There could be photographs. There could be documents. But, and there, then, but there are no photographs. I don't, I don't know what there is. Well, there was, there was no photography in George Washington's day. So the point is, look at the evidence. What evidence do you have? I, I know. That's what I'm asking you. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you, according to your sphere, your criteria for acceptable evidence, to make something move from the column of claim to fact. Right. What is necessary to prove that George Washington is a fact? Okay, specifically George Washington? Yeah, specifically okay. George Washington. Because right. the reason why is that it's really easy, just it's another logical fallacy that you're slipping into. That because more historical time has lapsed between us and Jesus, we can't prove it. Well, just let's shrink the, the time. Let's just shrink it to George Washington and then see if we can prove that. So take a stand at it. Okay, so I would say personally I have not looked into the evidence specifically for George Washington. And part of that is because, like I said earlier, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. It doesn't really affect my life that much. You know, like you say, I need to accept Jesus or else, you know, I'm lost. I'm going to go to hell. That's, those, are big, those are big consequences. So it's a big thing to look into. So I spent a lot of my time, and I did not leave the faith easily. In fact, I, was, I would have stayed in the faith if I could just find one little thread to hold on Yeah, but on Bernie, through. the process would be the same. Right. The process for, for moving Jesus from claim to fact concerning his existence mm -hmm. would be the exact same scientific process as you would for George Washington. Right. So yeah, I agree. one might be a bigger claim than the other. One might impact your life more than the other. But, but try it. Tell us how we would prove George Washington's existence by your criteria for proof. Well, I, all I can just say is, like I said, generally speaking, I'd have to say look at all the evidence, but it's what, not, it's yeah, not but a big I want question. to know what that is. I mean, you're too general on this. He for you have to give more specifics. For this. Huh? And I think that there's a general consensus that Jesus is a historical figure, but there's a lot of supernatural claims that go along with Jesus that don't go along with George Washington. So no, but I'm just asking for the existence, and and Bernie should, in his system, if he's going to put so much value on scientific evidence and proof. He should be able to tell us today how that works. But why should it I should, care? Because science, well, no, listen, listen, it's very simple. Science has been working for a long time to give to us a very precise uh, list of criteria and steps to prove anything. We do it. So do it. Take us into your laboratory and tell us how we prove the existence of my great-grandfather or my great-great-great-grandmother or one of my distant relatives, Mary Weather. Tell us how we do that. But why should I care about that? I mean, that's, if, if I did that seriously, it would take a no, lot of time. No, you should care about your method. And you, you, I know you can't answer it because you can't tell me what your method is. You can just say scientific evidence or scientific practice, but you don't, Bernie, you don't even know what that means. That's my point. You can't tell me how we prove the existence of George Washington. You can't tell me how you prove the existence of Jesus. You cannot tell me. That's why you're stalling. Well, well no, it's not stalling. It's just, it, there's a very simple principle here, too. It's, um, it's called the burden of evidence. This is actually another one of the logical fallacies on here. This is, this is a critical one, burden of proof. What this means is the person making the claim has the burden of proof. So again, like if I said I came from another planet and I want you to leave with me tonight or else you're going to die because an asteroid is going to hit this earth, 
the burden of proof, uh, you can't, I can't say prove me wrong, come on, what do you got? The burden of proof is on me. I, I'm saying these are the claims, let me show you my evidence, okay? So if I say believe in Jesus, I should say here's, here's the evidence for it. Yeah, but the, it goes both ways because you and claim. Is, so, like, what is the evidence? For, that, let, let, let me that, finish. Though. So, okay. what is the evidence for George Washington? I don't know. I never looked into it. There's no claims there. So, I mean, okay. I could look into every president, David. I don't have time for all that. So, but if somebody's okay. gonna make a big claim about Jesus, I got time for that. Well, unfortunately, this has been good. Unfortunately, speaking of time, we're out of it because uh, here comes Mrs. Olchi. Thank you so much, Barry. Right. Thank you.